Good afternoon, everyone. It's Dr. Gershon, and I'm here today with another Better Health webinar series with really an incredible company, Clinetic. Um, the CEO is here. His name is Tom Kaminsky. He's a visionary. He's a leader, and he is here to today to talk to you about problems that are in the healthcare system that are related to clinical trials and the registration of clinical trials which slows down the process of getting important new novel breakthrough drugs to patients. And in this discussion, um, I want to make sure that everyone realizes that this is an interactive conversation. Um, it is, for all intents and purposes, a chance to really hear from an incredible entrepreneur and then ask the, the entrepreneur questions. If we don't get to your questions today, we will get back to you during the week. But we're extremely appreciative of the incredible uh, response, you know, that over the past uh, several months we've received. We're extremely appreciative of, of people um, sending emails and texts and comments. And um, we would like to encourage people right now to let us know where they are calling in from. Um, any, I, any comments about their personal experiences within the healthcare system are appreciated during the conversation today. And, um, with that, I would like, uh, first to turn it over to Tom, um, so that he can tell you a little bit about himself and his personal story, how he got involved as an entrepreneur what his vision is, and most importantly, what this really means for you as a patient. So Tom, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you here on Better Health. And I look forward to uh, you talking to the, the audience here today and explaining a little bit about your motivation, what got you started, some of the things that you have seen as an entrepreneur, and what you, what you hope to accomplish. Thanks, Martin. I appreciate you having me. Look forward to the discussion today. So if you could start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how this vision for Clinetic began and some of the things that have motivated you and, and some of the aspirations you have in the work that you're doing within the clinical trial arena. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, taking one step back, I spent about a decade at LabCorp, um, most recently had led strategy there for the company that spanned both the, the diagnostics business and the covalent drug development business at the enterprise level. And my team there, in addition to strategic planning, led the launch of several new business initiatives, kind of startups, you know, within the company, um, which started to give me exposure to that entrepreneurial spirit. So we launched things like Pixel by LabCorp, which was LabCorp's direct to consumer platform. Um, it was the first to uh, have an FDA authorization for at-home COVID testing um, when uh, in the early days of COVID, um, you know, which really uh, uh, led to rapid growth, you know, in that business unit. We had to hire 50 people um, just to open the boxes that were coming into the lab. We had so many orders. Um, it's one of those things when you're putting together a business plan, you never think that you'd have to worry about that, but, uh, you know, it was an amazing experience and very proud of it. Um, uh, not only from a, you know, business learning perspective, but how many patients we were able to help, you know, during that, uh, you know, tough time of COVID. Um, so did that, we did, um, we started a new business unit called LabCorp employer solutions, uh, to, to drive wellness testing, um, uh, you know, through employers. Um, we did a lot, uh, at the intersection of diagnostics and drug development and specifically on patient recruitment, uh, you know, had worked with, you know, several uh, kind of new companies that um, were touting innovation, innovative solutions for, you know, driving, uh, you know, patients into to studies to, you know, really, uh, you know, help those kind of patients in need and help advance new technologies. And, you know, from that work, we saw very little at the end of the day um, with patients actually getting into to studies. and you know, didn't really understand why that was the case until we really dived into the weeds, uh, you know, of this, you know, with, uh, with Clinetic. So, you know, I left LabCorp in July of 2020 to work on this 
full time. Uh, I had previously also worked at at Duke and had reconnected with some colleagues, uh, former colleagues at Duke, who were working on the initial ideas for what has become Clinetic. Uh, you know, so kind of got the start, uh, you know, on it that way, and uh, you know, just been really uh, kind of learned a ton and uh, really proud of the, the the progress we've made so far. Terrific. Can you s- summarize, you know, for everybody, if you had to describe your company, what its mission is and what the vision is for the future? Can you can you do that for us? Yeah, I mean, really, the I mean, the vision is to um, to really accelerate that clinical research and kind of bring it into the you know 21st century. Um, one of the biggest things that has been eye-opening uh, to me um, now kind of closer to the details is just how many of the uh, important processes feels like you're back in the 1970s. I mean, literally pen and paper still being used um, to do like very important tasks. Um, like how do you identify patients that match protocols for clinical trials? How do you actually activate and get them enrolled? Um, you know, we've not talked with 30 plus academic health systems. And we've not seen a, uh, a single one that has digitized this important kind of workflow. Um, and, uh, you know, even Duke, where we got our start, which is more advanced than many, is still very much, you know, on pen and paper. So, you know, we're spending a ton of time, you know, with the folks whose job, you know, who, who it is to do this work, you know, who's kind of overburdened uh, and uh, kind of understaffed, on, you know, for so many reasons and really help, you know, them do their work, you know, more efficiently so that, they can drive, um, you know, these patients into studies, which then helps, uh, you know, advance the development of new, you know, therapeutics and diagnostics and devices, and is ultimately, you know, benefiting, you know, patient care. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, that's everybody's kind of goal here is um, kind of, you know, better health outcomes for for more patients. That's a perfect segue to a little video that we're going to show now, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective about you as a leader, the vision for the company and most importantly, the impact on patients. So let me put this video on for everyone. Thank you everyone first for logging in. Um, I see people here from all over, um, from California, from San Diego. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nikhil from Canada. Thank you, Chad from Dallas, Martin from Norway. Um, Thank you so much for signing in. Thank you, Malik from New York, my home city. Um, Let me, entertain you a bit with this, I think, informative video, and then we will come back. ...dramatically over the past 30 years. Medicine has advanced dramatically over the past 30 years. Clinical trials have not. In many cases, the medicine of the future is still being tested with the same clinical trial infrastructure used in the 1990s. Technology has evolved, so why haven't clinical trials? Secure digital technology has the potential to improve, enhance, and in some cases, reinvent the way clinical trials are conducted. Helping potential patients find trials, share data seamlessly, monitor progress, and track results. And helping clinical teams diversify patient populations, identify potential problems, clean and process data, and draft reports, all of which can lead to faster drug development, more comprehensive research, better patient services, and better results for both patients and pharmaceutical companies. So that was a great overview of first the problem and then the solution and then finally the outcome. So as I see it, Healthcare is going through an incredible sea change because of technology, but also because of leadership and vision. The technology part comes in collaboration with organizations and founders like yours. You see from a real world perspective, Tom, as you were describing your period at LabCorp, the real impact that lack of um, registration for clinical trials can have in terms of moving drug discovery, drug development, and drug commercialization forward. 
There are other companies as well, one of which I work with closely, Clinical Trial Hero, that is in sync with all of what you're doing, which is creating this incredible community of hospitals and medical centers, which is extremely patient centric. And Clinical Trial Hero is recognizing and working on a subset of that, which is the DEI community and the DEI track. And they're using cloud-based programs and applications to identify patients who fall through the cracks and are underrepresented in the DEI community, track the patients in terms of their compliance within the clinical trial, and then follow through to make sure that they sustain themselves as members of the clinical trial, and then after the clinical trial, follow, follow on with outcome research. And you will be hearing later this month from incredible organizations like Komodo Health and Flatiron Health about one of the things that you mentioned earlier, which is outcomes. And so the focus at Endeavor and our venture studio is looking at leaders like yourself and Dr. Joshi, who heads up Clinical Trial Hero, and understanding how collaborations can create win-win situations, which most importantly impact patients and the outcomes. So I would like with that kind of overview to get a better understanding of what you see um, from your perspective about what's happening inside these medical centers, what's happening as you connect these medical centers and the response from both healthcare providers and from patients. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I mean, we, we really have, you know, oriented our, our company around meeting health system needs, you know, first and foremost, I mean, the large academic health systems are the, the groups in this country that, you know, see, you know, the patients and, you know, drive research and really understanding kind of what their pain points and unmet needs are. Um, to really drive, uh, you know, these processes into the future, as the you know, as the video was showing. So um, we've spent a ton of time doing focus groups with these research nurse coordinators, whose job it is to actually identify and enroll patients and uh, watch how they do that today, and ask for feedback on, you know, what how we could make their uh, life easier through uh, technology. And really, our vision is to be the easy button for them, um, so that they can focus on those patient interactions and not have to worry about trying to run IT data queries to get patient names or um, kind of sift through paper charts uh, to really find, you know, in the 50th encounter, that particular piece of information that they need to qualify or disqualify a patient from a study. We're really surfacing all of the information, you know, on tap at their fingertips um, and curating it. So it's super easy, you know, for them to align to, uh, you know, the study criteria and then really drive that activation, you know, and enrollment, uh, you know, for, for patients. Um, one thing in particular that we've <clears throat> noticed that some of these large academic health systems that have, um, you know, pretty wide uh, infrastructure spanning both the inpatient and outpatient setting is uh, even within a health system like Duke, they have lots of uh, patients visiting lots of different clinics a lot of those clinics might not necessarily be ones that are, you know, traditionally participating in studies. The traditional way of doing this is you actually staff a, uh, a nurse at a physical clinic and they are kind of watching the patients as they come through to see who they, you know, might be uh, a good fit for a, for a clinical study. Um, what you're able to do with technology is really centralize and virtualize that function across many physical locations. So. Uh, one of our first, uh, you know, uh, big studies was in uh, infant RSV. We did a prospective study uh, where we were trying to find infants less than one years old who had had a lower respiratory tract infection. <clears throat> so very specific patient population. And what we found, <clears throat> just even at Duke alone, that those patients were presenting at 70 plus physical locations. So th the old way of doing it would have been you pick your two largest clinics, you staff a nurse in each one, you would have been missing 80% of your patients, you know, that way, kind of with the new approach, you're able to have a single 
nurse study coordinator uh, centrally located, essentially being surfaced a list of patients who had presented the previous day across all 70 plus clinics, uh, doing phone call outreach to uh, describe the study opportunity and um, you know why it was good for the patient, why it was good for advancing you know the technology and. Through that approach, uh, we successfully enrolled almost half of all patients that Duke saw over the four month study period um, across all 70 plus physical locations, which was a bigger proof point than anything I'd ever seen at LabCorp. I mean, as it relates to this, right, can you actually activate patients kind of on that last mile? So that was really what we started to get excited about and kind of the juices flowing and really have built you know, off of that success now to apply the same approach um, you know, at additional, you know, health systems and, um, you know, Martin, as you mentioned, kind of collaborating with, um, you know, other companies to really bring this solution together. You know, we are not a CRO, we are not a, a pharma company, you know, we're a piece of the puzzle, you know, and we realize that, uh, you know, there's lots of different kind of companies and kind of capabilities in the, the ecosystem that need to come together to ultimately kind of solve the, you know, this problem and advance new therapies and advanced patient care. You know, there, there's just so much to unpack there. First of all, the notion, you know, that you're a piece, you know, of the puzzle to be solved is is critical. And I think that highlights one of the things, again, that I keep on repeating, which is the notion that this is a new book in terms of what entrepreneurs are doing for the world. So the past 20 years, it was all about disruptive innovation, um, kind of a zero sum game you know, you're going to be the top of the mountain because you're first to market. You're going to spend all kinds of money to capture market share and everybody else is going to fall by the wayside. Now, the story is very different. The story is about collaboration. The story is that there can be a lot of winners and the ultimate winner is going to be the healthcare system and the patients. So the more people who have leadership qualities, who want to build teams, build collaborations, um, the more that these problems are going to be solved. And the complexity of the problems requires this collaboration, in my opinion. So for example, the notion that you have this incredible personal relationship with Duke, the incredible number of centers that are around Duke, the ability to integrate a cloud-based program which emphasizes the intersection of decentralizing this process, but then pulling that data into a very user-friendly format requires collaboration with big tech like Microsoft and Google and the developers that Endeavor works with, Capgemini, who writes a lot of the code for many of the big tech players. So we actually encourage, and it's really kind of a, an open call to companies at large to work within this collaborative framework within a specific corridor that we feel is very effective, which is the workshop. So I would love to have you and Clinical Trial Hero work with um, Microsoft, work with Google, work with Capgemini, to talk about some of the real life experiences that you are seeing down at Duke and in other centers so that we can begin to integrate real life problem solving solutions that bring technology and innovation into this very personalized experience that you have because of your networks and your growing ecosystem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think that, you know, the most important thing is as a leader to really hear, really listen and really hear, you know, what your company is doing to impact the consumer or the user. And so listening to the nurses and understanding how your service is helping them do their job as part of their enrollment process and, and then listening to the patients. So I don't know if you personally or members of your team or through feedback from the nurses have gotten some personalized accounts from any of the patients in these processes. If you have, it would be great you know, to explore some of that with you here. 
Yeah, we've, uh, I mean, we, we see it, uh, I would say, uh, kind of on the periphery. Um, you know, we really have focused on those nurse, uh, you know, study coordinators and helping them do their job, you know, most efficiently, who they are obviously interacting, you know, directly with those patients. <clears throat> you know, one thing that we have learned uh, that is super important in, in healthcare, uh, especially when you start to overlay technology, is there's obviously data security and patient privacy, yeah, you know, items that are very much top of mind. And, um, you know, having been hatched within Duke, um, really understanding uh, how to navigate those so that you're building the uh, technology, um, you know, appropriately um, in a way that works for the health systems and also works for the employees and it works for, um, you know, pharma and other collaborators, you know, in that context, uh, you know, Clinic does not see any identified patient data and we keep all PHI behind the firewall. And so our software is enabling, you know, those, uh, you know, important, you know, workers to do their job uh, and interact with the patients and kind of drive those patient outcomes. But Clinetic is kind of a step removed appropriately. So from, you know, actually being able to, um, uh, you know, kind of see those great patient stories, you, you know, as much as we'd like to see them, like we've got like those data security, patient privacy things very much top of mind in terms of how we architected our solution. And that's a really good point, you know, and again, the integration of technology, you know, perhaps blockchain might play an important role in this in the future. Um, there are other technologies that people are exploring within healthcare, you know, which have creative ways of, of, of addressing some of these problems. But certainly, you know, the ability to um, speak to the people that are on the ground and find out what works. Um, I hear that embedded in your story, you know, so these relationships that you have with the nurses and the nurse practitioners and the people that are enrolling patients is absolutely critical. They know that human interaction with technology is what I'm really focused in on at Endeavor. Innovation or technology just for the cool factor doesn't mean anything. Innovation and technology that changes people's lives and changes outcomes in healthcare, that's really what we're focused in on here. So in terms of, you know, the change that I hear is faster enrollment. Um, within this faster enrollment, do you have a sense about the number of patients who drop out of studies within your system? compared to other other groups? Yeah, we haven't uh, yet tackled the uh, kind of the workflow of retention. Our, for, for today, where we've gotten our start is really focused on, you know, how do you um, appropriately uh, and efficiently identify, you know, very specific patients of interest, enable that study team to kind of get them enrolled. <clears throat> uh, you know, kind of the way it's working today is once they're enrolled, then they're kind of following, uh, you know, then their traditional processes. But, you know, that's kind of our, uh, I, I think as we are now, you know, behind the firewall uh, at health systems, uh, we're contracted with 10 academic health systems now. And, um, you know, connected to the EHR data and helping, uh, you know, the health care personnel, you know, do that, their jobs more efficiently. Um, there's no doubt there's going to be lots of additional steps in the process, you know, to make, make more efficient. Um, we kind of started with patient identification recruitment just because it's kind of well known to be, you know, one of the biggest bottlenecks of clinical trials operations. But, uh, you know, the, to your point, there's uh, all sorts of uh, other, you know, workflows to modernize, you know, as you kind of build out kind of the, the end solution. Now, I, I want to shift a little bit towards one of the things that you mentioned, the term pain points. So pain points on the pharma side. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, you have a great business background at LabCorp. What do you see, what is, what's the message that large pharma or large biotech is giving you, you know, in, in the rollout of your business? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, time, time matters and speed matters um, in terms of every day and that, that goes by that uh, additional, you know, patient or a clinical trial takes longer is a, you know, 600K to $8 million of kind of lost revenue on, on the back end. So there certainly in general is a, um, a willingness to, you know, pay for, um, you know, uh, 
for speed, assuming there's a, a appropriate level of quality. Um, one of the other big pain points we've uh, kind of uncovered on the, the pharma side is just visibility into that patient recruitment funnel. I mean, it's often a black box of, you know, they sign up all these sites like a Duke to participate in studies and um, uh, that information flow of kind of what is actually going on and kind of what is the progress of uh, enrollment and uh, kind of where are kind of folks kind of, you know, falling out of the funnel and kind of what does that funnel look like and kind of what really are the blockers. Um, it, it's a bit of a black box and uh, quite a big time lag um, in terms of information kind of coming back to pharma. So it might be six months that the you know study has gotten up and running and, you know, some of that initial feedback is now just making its way, you know, back to um, the, the clinical trial operations, you know, team. Um, really one of the benefits that we've kind of positioned and kind of built the technology around is just providing that real time visibility. So um, and tying it back to um, like, what is the actual patient population at, you know, at the health systems? So you have a general sense of there's this many patients based on the EHR data aligned to the study protocol. Um, you can then see because we have digitized this workflow, how many patients have actually <clears throat> been pre-screened by the the um, study coordinators and the study team, um, you know, 30 to 40 percent of positions in those roles are open, kind of given, uh, you know, the, the remnants of the great resignation and everything that's happened with COVID and research nurses getting pulled into more clinical roles. So that is a bottleneck, you know, for many and another big problem, you know, to solve. How can you make that more efficient, potentially centralize it across academic health systems? Um, but kind of beyond the screening step, you know, why are they screening out and then for folks who are eligible and not participating, what are those reasons why? So we provide kind of that real time, you know, dashboarding that pharma can see the aggregate patient counts across the health systems that are using the technology really to have a finger on the pulse of kind of what is going on with the recruitment funnel. And um, if recruitment is lagging, as is the majority of the time, you know, the case, you can be more proactive in terms of how you're following up um, and tactics, you know, you can take to address yeah, that with real data um, kind of in real time. What are some of the other centers be beyond Duke that you're working with? Yeah, we've got a great uh, mix of folks who are contracted and working with um, University of South Florida and Tampa General Hospital, you know, for example, down in Florida with Renown Health in Nevada, um, with SUNY up in New York. Um, we've got Our Lady of the Lakes in Louisiana, University of Minnesota, um, we've got Jefferson Health in Pennsylvania. Um, so we've really set up a nice, you know, footprint um, kind of with uh, geographic coverage, uh, number one, uh, as well as different mixes of patient diversity um, and, um, you know, different types of patient populations. So we've got a kind of nice network we can kind of for lots of different types of studies um, kind of do that, that matching with kind of the right health systems. Let's talk a little bit about what I would call the secret sauce. So if you had to describe your competitive advantage or your ability to be synergistic with other organizations, they could be CROs or they could be, you know, large organizations that are AI driven um, data gatherers. Like what is your secret sauce that you bring into the collaboration picture that makes you unique? Yeah, I think it's it's the combination of the timely and deep EHR data connectivity. I mean, it starts there and there is uh, certainly specialized uh, kind of knowledge and expertise in terms of how do you do that um, when, you know, you're connecting to these EHR data warehouse, you know, uh, infrastructure, they, there can be 20,000 plus tables of, you know, data and the know-how of where do you pull that from? How do you curate, you know, the unstructured portions, you know, of that medical record? How can you pull out key clinical concepts from the procedure report, the image report, the pathology report that is needed for the inclusion exclusion criteria for these protocols? Like that certainly is uh, a differentiator. And then really coupling that with a <clears throat> workflow tool that the study team wants to use. So you actually get that patient activation. That was the biggest gap that I saw when I was at LabCorp is a lot of folks had, were starting to establish EHR connectivity really for patient counts. And you would, it's nice to know that Duke has 53 patients with XYZ, but it's an entirely different thing of like, how do you actually activate, you know, those patients? 
to do some desired next step, whether it's enrollment into a clinical study or a digital care management program or whatever the next step desired by the provider and you know clinical team you know would be. So that's really where we have focused our energy of, like I said, doing the focus groups with those end users of these are the people whose job it is to do that. And you link it to then that specialized EHR data connectivity to kind of complete the puzzle pieces and really be able to drive that activation, you know, patients at the end of the day. And then all of that in construct of how do you make the architecture work for these large, you know, health systems, again, with patient privacy and data security top of mind. So what EHR systems do you integrate with? Yeah, we're, uh, we're EHR agnostic. Um, most of the academic health systems we're working with are on Epic, um, you know, as most academic health systems are. So we're most familiar with how, um, you know, health systems have kind of pulled data out of their, you know, Epic, you know, uh, EHR, but we're, we're agnostic in terms of uh, which vendor it actually is. And we map, um, you know, all that source data to a, you know, fire-based uh, clinic data model that we've extended specifically for research so that there's curation, normalization, standardization across health systems. Have you worked with any of the healthcare systems using Nuance? Uh, not yet. Okay. And then in terms of the future, let's take a look forward. You know, I know that you're, you know, incredibly organized, structured. Um, I know that you have a, a far looking business plan. Tell us a little bit about what you see, you know, first as what your company could, could use in terms of support right now. If there are companies out there that you could send a message to, if there are organizations or people that you could send a message to first, you know, who would that be? What would the message be? And then the second part of that question is looking forward as you build relationships and you look forward to growth and scaling, where do you see the company going in several years? Yeah, maybe uh, starting with the second question and coming back, you know, to the first, I think, um, you know, some of the things we're most excited about is, is kind of, as I was mentioning, as you were now behind, you know, the firewall at and health systems um, and connected to the EHR data, what more, you know, can you do, you know, with that in terms of driving additional efficiencies? We're frequently asked, you know, why do you have these uh, electronic data capture systems that nurses have to manually enter all the data into? Why can't, now that you have the patient's EHR data, that will flow, you know, automatically, you know, into these EDC systems? Um, you know, uh, why, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> um, can't you, uh, you know, centralize some of this patient identification and recruitment function across not only many physical locations within a health system, but across health systems, given the shortage of kind of these kind of key, you know, research nurse, you know, roles and really have a tech enabled service model that drives efficiency, you know, for everybody and kind of is a win-win for pharma health systems, the companies, the ecosystem. Um, and then as we continue to scale the health system network, um, really thinking about uh, what we call turnkey implementation science programs, where with a similar approach of patient activation, um, you know, you can identify patients, for example, who should be receiving a new diagnostic test that has been, you know, uh, you know, authorized by, uh, you know, FDA and uh, helping the health system uh, kind of get those, you know, folks identified and, and tested and as it then happens, um, you're collecting the longitudinal data in the EHR and you put those two together and you're actually kind of driving, you know, real world evidence, real world uh, data studies um, to really help, you know, accelerate, um, you know, the, the adoption of those, um, you know, new innovations that again, ultimately, you know, help drive improvements in patient care. Um, you know, so with all of that, uh, you know, no one company can, you know, tackle that, you know, all, you know, all by themselves. Um, you know, we're <clears throat> very, um, you know, interested in collaborating with, with companies that have um, uh, kind of that uh, kind of larger con connectivity with, with health systems um, and have relationships there and are looking for um, kind of innovative technology solutions in kind of this very specific uh, you know, arena that I described, um, there's obviously on the, um, uh, kind of the AI NLP, uh, kind of side companies that are 
coming up with great ways to identify patients of interest. Um, we, we've done you know, some there, but we really view ourselves more as a distribution uh, kind of channel for some of those great kind of algorithms and you know, approaches um, to deploy. And we're doing that, taking some models that others have developed and using that as then the mechanism to, to identify patients you know, of interest. But we're not going to develop every you know, AI and NLP model you know, by ourselves, nor is really that our you know, focus. We're more focused on you know, the EHR connectivity and, and driving that last mile. So those are you know, probably two that come to mind. Great. Well, I want to take a second again to thank people who have logged in and were making comments. Um, there are some great comments which focus in on the educational piece of this whole field of medicine. Um, and I want to explore a little bit about that because th that really speaks to one of the issues, which is that there are cohorts of patients who are underserved. There are huge healthcare gaps with women, minorities. Um, there are age and gender identity specific disparities. Um, many of those not only impact the patient in terms of not getting the proper medical care, not getting enrolled in clinical trials for access to cutting edge therapies, but they also have an impact on the healthcare system at large because the data is skewed with an underrepresentation of the actual demographics of the population. And as you probably know, the FDA has come out for the past several years with increasingly stronger statements about the importance and now not requirement, but urging uh, a stronger and stronger emphasis on proper representation in the DEI community. Um, so I want to focus the education question on this underserved population, because I think for a lot of the things that we're looking to do, the issue is how do you identify patients, gain their trust, hear what their concerns are within racial, cultural, gender, or age specific differences, and then capture that material and deliver a trusting message in using technology to educate. So I know that this currently is not necessarily at the core of what you're looking at, but I just thought I would raise that subject because it seems that you know enrollment means enrollment with greater sense of you know healthcare equity. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on those issues. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know the uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives are certainly uh, top of mind. You know as we're having conversations with with pharma, um, again we we can address. Uh, you know, one piece of that puzzle where uh, actually within our <clears throat> patient identification tool, um, you know, we have the concept of, uh, you know, enrichment criteria and star ratings, um, you know, based on, um, you know, attributes of interest to a study. Um, one of the ones we're working on right now in cardiovascular disease, for example, there was a desire to um, kind of en enrich and prioritize based on gender, race, ethnicity, recency of diagnosis and certain meds. And so, that's helping, you know, the study team then kind of really identify and hone in on those patients. Um, what then needs to happen to truly reach, you know, those patients and drive engagement is a whole nother world that, you know, my company is not going to um, be able to tackle, but many, you know, others out there should, because um, it's a super important, um, you know, piece of actually driving, um, you know, that last mile. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we do do, um, which we have done for studies is um, because we can do the EHR data surveillance, we have a sense of what does the population mix look like at a health system. And then we can look at how does that compare to what is actually happening from an enrollment perspective. And you can actually then drive, you know, towards making sure, you know, you have equitable, you know, enrollment, um, you know, really with those diversity and inclusion, um, you know, thoughts top of mind. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you know, that has shifted over the past several decades is an understanding, you know, that 
within these verticals in, under the DEI umbrella, um, patients of, of different ages, different races, different genders, different cultural backgrounds respond very differently to medication. And um, incidence of disease and prevalence of disease is different, but also how these patients respond to a certain medication um, has a component that is not being addressed in current clinical trials. So, you know, what I see as exciting in the future in this collaborative umbrella of leadership towards outcome changes is the ability to bring technology to people like yourself through wearable sensors, being able to pick up biometric data, which would be included into these clinical trials. You kind of alluded to a little bit of this automation um, wish list. And I think more and more voice biomarkers, wearable sensors, um, certainly facial recognition is a critical component within healthcare. And then, as you mentioned, the security of data aspect. So it's an incredibly complex puzzle, but the stakes are very, very high. You know, the complications from medications cause a massive healthcare and economic burden, you know, in the United States and across the world. And I think getting more and more accurate data through better controlled clinical trials will improve safety and efficacy information and will allow treatment algorithms to be modified so that the proper medication gets to the proper patient. And then ultimately what's super exciting for me is this precision medicine aspect, which takes DEI to the next level. So really understanding the genetic makeup, really understanding you know, how we can personalize a lot of drug development. You know, we see now with companies like Bluebird Bio, with Insilico, the incredible ability for technology to target um, incredible pathways, pick targets, develop those drugs and commercialize um, based upon uh, genetic uh, profiles. And I think that, you know, what I see over the next several years is the integration of this very human experience that you're talking about, very kind of, you know, compassionate experience, um, integrating into these incredible technologies, with AI, with wearable sensors, with voice biomarkers. Um, and then the next piece of that, which I briefly talked about um, earlier in the webinar, is companies like Flatiron Health and Komodo that are going to take this data and they're going to find ways to be able to see things in this big data analysis that we're not currently seeing. And I think that evolution will reshape how we design clinical trials, who we look to to enroll in these clinical trials, and then ultimately this is really going to change how the treatment algorithms are going to be completely reshaped. So for me, you know, I think that you are at the tip of the spear here, um, as is clinical trial hero. Um, it's an exciting time to be a physician. It's an exciting time to be an investor. And um, I want to thank everybody. There's a tremendous number of comments here, which we can't get to today because we're running out of time. But I want to thank Nikhil and Michael. I want to thank Arya. I want to thank uh, Marjit uh, and Sean and Jenny. Um, I, and anybody else, please let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, it's exciting to have an interactive audience with all of these comments. We will get back to you over the course of the next week. I will send the appropriate comments to Tom for his insights as he has a different perspective on things as an operator, as opposed to myself as an investor. So thank you everybody really for all of your thoughtful comments. And thank you, Tom, really for bringing, you know, to the audience and to the webinar an insight into clinical trial development and the changes that are taking place. It's been a real pleasure. 
Do you have any closing thoughts or comments that you'd like to share with the audience? No, I just uh, appreciate you having me on and kind of talking about the future. I mean, like you said, there's uh, there's so many problems to tackle with kind of combination of technology and the human element and uh, just really excited about the, the future for everyone. Again, thank you, Tom. I look forward to continuing this incredible dialogue, making some of these introductions to, I think, important potential collaboration partners who may have their own ideas about how to advance what you're doing. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Tom, please stay on for a few minutes. Thanks, Martin.